I wanted to write an uplifting sermon. It's summer. It's the last time I'll preach at South Church. I wanted to give you an upbeat story that made you feel good, and then we could all leave this space dancing. Instead, I have a story that has no easy answers and no simple solutions. I have a story that frankly would make a terrible movie because there's no resolution at the end. And yet, just a couple of weeks ago, this congregation commissioned a group of 14 of us to be ambassadors from this church. You commissioned us to journey across the country with open hearts and open arms and to return carrying the stories of the people we met on our way. And so this morning, I bring you honest tales from the Cheyenne River Tribe Reservation. But before I tell you those stories, I, I feel compelled to try to explain how this experience sat differently with me than anything I've encountered before. As you may know, I've spent a fair bit of time in places where folks are living in tough economic conditions, from poor communities in Central America and along the U.S.-Mexico border, to urban areas where, uh, here in the U.S., where gentrification uh, and lack of employment are pushing folks out of their longtime homes. I've been privileged myself to lead a life of relative economic comfort and stability. Um, but I have spent this time with communities who have struggled under similar economic burdens to those that we encountered on the reservation. Lack of employment, lack of access to healthy food, failing schools, inadequate access to medical care, and on and on. I've also spent time in places that had even fewer economic supports than what we encountered on the reservation. I've spent time with undocumented communities that did not have social security numbers and thus were ineligible for food assistance or housing assistance. I'm not telling you this to create a who is worse off competition or to diminish the economic poverty that we saw on the reservation, which was brutal in its own way. But rather, what I want to point out is that economic poverty alone doesn't explain what I saw on the reservation. Economic poverty alone doesn't explain the state of hopelessness. It doesn't explain the level of substance abuse or violence. It doesn't explain fully the ruptures within the families and community. I have spent time in communities that were materially poor but wildly rich when it came to culture and hospitality and joy. But that's not what I saw in my week on the reservation. I've never before seen this level of community breakdown, this level of checked outness among the adults, this level of what I can only call spiritual poverty. And while economic poverty is obviously devastating and it is a form of systemic violence that we must speak out against, in some ways it's relatively easy to show up and help out when that's all you're dealing with. You can make someone a meal you can even build someone a house. On the other hand, hope, meaning, purpose, compassion, the ability to dream, those are things you can't show up and hand out. But what does spiritual poverty even look like? The truth is I, I can't put my finger on it exactly, but I have these couple of moments from the trip that just keep looping in my mind, and so the best I can do is share those moments with you. One day during the afternoon summer camp, we helped to run, a little girl caught a frog. 
She took it home in a cup that afternoon, but as soon as she got home, her brother grabbed it, grabbed a pair of scissors, and cut the frog in half. The next day, she came back and caught another frog, and I was left guarding the cup as she ran off to play. A group of kids gathered around me and asked if they could see the frog. But they asked it in a way that I wasn't particularly compelled to hand them the cup. So instead, I asked them what their intentions were with the frog. And very matter-of-factly, an eight-year-old boy said, we plan to kill it. And I said, why do you want to kill the frog? And he said, because I can. During our week on the reservation, a 14-year-old girl in the community took her own life. A few days later, some of our Granby teens got into a conversation with some of the kids from the res all about suicide. After the conversation, one of them came to speak to me and said, it was a fine conversation, but she was really startled by how nonchalantly the kids talked about suicide. I'm not sure if I'll do it. I might. I don't know what the future holds. Despite their sadness about the loss of their friend, they weren't willing to take suicide off the table as a viable option for their futures. The kids that our teens were talking to were all between 10 and 13 years old. An older woman named Barbara grew up on the Cheyenne River Tribe Reservation. She struggled with addiction in her younger adult years. At some point, she left the reservation. Things had gotten really bad for her. And she went to the nearby Rosebud Reservation. And there she encountered some elders who knew about the old ways, the old Lakota ways. They taught her how to sew the traditional star quilt. And the sewing of this quilt is knowledge passed down from the generations, but it also involves women sitting around together and talking as they sew, like many quilting communities. In her time away, she also found a religious community. In this case, it happened to be a Christian church. She drank from these two spiritual wells, and they impacted her profoundly. She gave up drinking. She gave up drug use. This is an incredible triumph, and it gave her back huge parts of her life, and it allowed her to show up in new ways to her kids and later her grandkids, several of whom she is raising. However, upon returning to her home community, she wasn't praised for this transformation. Instead, she was shunned. Folks who were still deep in their addiction dismissed her. People sneered at her and reminded her that she was still just a drunk. They accused her of acting like she was better than they were, asking, who do you think you are? Barbara remains grateful that she found a way out of that old life, but staying on the, what she calls the straight and narrow path gets awfully lonely sometimes. So in our text for today, Moses is in the process of leading this whole community of folks um, through the desert. His people, as you know, were enslaved for more than 400 years in Egypt, and they were cruelly mistreated. They finally escaped slavery only to wander lost again without a sense of purpose. This refugee community who were already recipients of generation after generation after generation of trauma are now facing this new set of extenuating circumstances for which they have limited coping mechanisms because coping mechanisms are of course something we also pass down and if that has not been passed down um, it is hard for people to recover. So only three months into this journey of Moses and his followers, the people's faith in Moses is beginning to flag. There's mistrust and anger and desperation and exhaustion and infighting. It's all cropping up around them. And that's where we are when we start the text for today, when God calls Moses to the mountain. And then, as you heard, God speaks to Moses from this billowing kind of cloud of smoke. And in that time, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, which I basically see as ethical 
ritual guidelines for navigating life with each other and with God. These tools were given to Moses as a way of guiding his people so that they could learn how to peacefully coexist. And thousands of years later, of course, they remain central tenets of our faith and of our uh, kind of civic code, even if that's not expressly said. Whether or not we always follow them perfectly, they are certainly things that we can generally agree upon. Honor your parents. Don't murder people. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against someone else. Don't lust after your neighbor's life, be it their spouse or their property. And then the commandments also give these worship instructions about how to worship God, how to prepare a sacrifice for God. Well, the Lakota people also have such a story, one that I can't help but seeing as parallel to our Exodus narrative uh, that we read from today. And this story was shared with me um, by a man on the reservation named George. Uh, I, I think I got most of the details from him, but then I looked it up when I came back to make sure I was getting it right. And it turns out this story is all over the place. This is a very central story for the Lakota people. Um, the details do change from version to version, but this is the kind of central essence of the story. And it's the story of the white buffalo calf woman. Long, long ago, the Lakota people were facing a time of famine. On this particular day, two bow hunters were sent out to find food for their people. After hours of hunting, they were exhausted, and they came over the crest of this hill, and they saw this stunningly beautiful woman. One of the two hunters was filled with lust and desire for the woman, and he planned to claim her by force. His fellow hunter said it was a terrible idea and warned him to lay off, but the first man ignored his advice and headed towards the woman at a jog. But as he neared her, a giant cloud suddenly enveloped the hilltop. And when it dissipated, all that was left was the woman and a pile of bones. The second man was, of course, terrified. He wasn't sure if he should shoot or if he should run. He was trying to decide, and at that moment, the woman beckoned him towards her, saying, don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. So um, he headed over to the woman, and she explained to him that she was wakan, or holy, and that if he followed her directions, his people would rise again. Well, he seemed, it seemed like a very good thing, something his tribe would be happy to hear about. So he agreed, and she said, prepare your people. I will be there to speak with you shortly. Once the people had gathered, she appeared, and she spoke with the whole group, and she gave them the seven sacred rites and the chanumpa, or the sacred pipe. Then she left the people, saying, there will be four ages, and I will look in on you once in each age. At the end of the four ages, I will return. As she walked away, she changed from a beautiful maiden into a black buffalo, and then a red-brown buffalo, and then a yellow buffalo, and then finally she turned into a white buffalo and then disappeared into the clouds. This woman is known as Wakantanka, or Great Spirit, and the rites she gave to her people were the sacred pipe ceremony, the sweat lodge ceremony, the vision quest, the sun dance, the making of relatives ritual, the keeping of your soul ritual, and the coming of age ritual. These rites were powerful tools for the Lakota, as one Lakota leader, Red Deer, wrote in 2001, these ceremonies occur during different stages of human life and seasonal change. Though they are different in nature, the common focus among them all is the health and healing of individuals and the community. Proper, regular involvement in the essential community ceremonies 
was long seen as fundamental to Lakota healing. So what happened? Well, just in case you were thinking, this sermon's not so bad. No, no, this is where it gets hard. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The prohibition of these ceremonies throughout the 19th and most of the 20th century by the U.S. government resulted in a complete loss of cultural continuity. People were brutally, brutally punished for practicing these sacred ways. Starting in 1879 and lasting until the late 1970s, incidentally, when I was born, this is not long ago, Native American children were taken from their families and forced to attend federally run boarding schools. These schools were a brainchild of a man by the name of Captain Richard Pratt of the U.S. Army, who famously said, quote, All the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. And so that's what the schools set out to do. A survivor of one of these schools, Walter Little Moon, has spoken publicly about his experience, and I read an interview with him. He recalls, quote, It was almost like a re-education camp where we were supposed to be turned into something that we weren't. So we were always being called uncivilized. To them, we were savages. We couldn't learn, and so... We were told that they had to do these things in order for us to learn, end quote. There were a variety of punishments for everything from not shining your shoes to being overheard speaking in Lakota. Quote, they beat you with like a carriage whip on your legs, and then there was this shorter whip, and they used that on your back and your shoulders, and then there was this third one that was called the ape stick, a, a boat paddle that had holes drilled in it. In other accounts that I read, I learned that children were also disciplined by being made to kneel on pencils for hours at a time. Sexual abuse was also rampant in these schools year after year after year. Well, after four years of this abuse, Little Moon ran away for the first time. But each time they would pick him up at his home where he had returned to his family and they'd return him to the school. He says, it was just a struggle on a daily basis, a struggle to be a human being even though we weren't treated that way. Walter Little Moon goes on to say that even his time serving on the front lines in Vietnam doesn't bother him to the extent that those boarding school memories do. He's been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a condition that comes as a result of suffering for months or years, and it particularly impacts children whose um, personalities and brains are still forming in the time that it takes place. Telling Native American people to just get past it, to just let go of their boarding school experience is like telling African Americans to get over the fact slavery happened or the Jewish community to get over the Holocaust. This is a trauma that lasted for over a hundred years and its results were devastating. There was the loss of language, the loss of culture, and the loss of intra-community ties. It's this breakdown within the community. Well, on the Cheyenne River Tribe Reservation, almost everybody over the age of 47 was forced to go to one of these boarding schools. Generations of trauma, generations of cultural theft, generations of shaming, generations of being overtly told that you are less than embeds itself in a community. And those scars are all too visible when you're there. So, what do we do? How do we contribute to healing this community after all that has been stolen? Guys, I wish I knew. 
I, I wish I had some answer that we could all agree upon and then just roll up our sleeves and get out and just do it. I know that Simply Smiles is doing their best. They're offering kids hope and encouraging their gifts and talents and reminding them that they could have a future that looks different than the lives they see all around them. I know that Simply Smiles has partnered with Fairfield University and that Fairfield University has agreed to offer full scholarships and full room and board to any student from the reservation who graduates from high school and is ready to attend college. I know there's one young woman named Wambli, which means eagle in Lakota. She was visiting Fairfield University the same week that our group was in South Dakota. And yes, I think there is great hope in that. And I pray that Wambli finds her wings and she soars to new heights and that other children watching her see that that is possible. But it's going to take dozens of young people like Wambli, who not only sees an opportunity to leave their home and everything they've known, to be a part of a culture that feels foreign, to make it through university half a country away from their families. But then, after they've learned how to do that, it's going to require some of them choosing to go back to the reservation, a place where there's no opportunity and little hope. And as we see from Barbara, people do not always celebrate your successes. And even those lucky ones, the ones that we will have seen as success stories, they will have succeeded by learning to navigate our culture. We will call them a success because they have navigated our culture and graduated from one of our universities. And while that is wonderful, it does not give them back the Lakota culture that was stolen from them. So often these service trips are hard physical work, yet participants can leave feeling good about themselves, certain that they're leaving that community a little bit better than when they arrived. I'd like to believe that our time on the Cheyenne River Tribe Reservation contributed to some greater good. But it wasn't a trip that left me with a do-gooder glow at the end, and I, I know from talking to other participants that I am not the only one who left feeling more hopeless than when I arrived. This was a trip that exposed me and the rest of our group to a community that is haunted. I leave this experience feeling both guilty and sad. But there is one thing I know that we can do. Knowing this story gives us the power to keep retelling this story and opening people's eyes to the harm that has been done and encouraging them to support hope-bringing programs happening on the reservation, this one and many others. Simply Smiles is like a teeny tiny pinprick of light. And there are many other pinpricks of light struggling to do good work in these reservations including a number of native-led projects that are reinvigorating cultural pride one person at a time, teaching the sacred rites, teaching the Lakota language. And so today, rather than uplift you, I give you the sacred gift and the sacred burden of these stories, trusting you to keep telling them until the day when white buffalo calf woman returns to her people and guides their spirits home once again. <laughs>